Mooding is quite popular right now. Well, at least by the time this video was created. Not sure if it still is when this is gonna be up on YouTube. People on Twitter are talking about it, stating their interest or even obsession to it. Even paleo artists and creature designers are making their own version of Mudang. And this image right here, it's drawn by the author of Dinosan. So the reach is quite far. Mudang might be a cute or funny baby hippo, but it's not just a baby hippo. To be precise, it's a baby pygmy hippo. But what does that mean? And how much does it matter? Well, let me brought up the question. What exactly is pygmy hippo? Pygmy hippopotamus or simply pygmy hippo is not just a hippopotamus with dwarfism. It's an entirely different species, different genus even. While the common hippopotamus is Hippopotamus amphibius, the pygmy hippo is Heropsis liberiensis. Her is from heros which means pig, and opsis is a suffix which indicates likeness. So it basically means resembling a pig. Liberiensis means from Liberia. It was not always like this, though. It was called Hippopotamus minor, which basically means small hippo. But it was moved to its own genus because it's too different. Back then, it was called Hexaprotodon liberiensis, which is the same genus as an extinct group of ancient hippos. Later, it was suggested to be moved into its own genus because it's also too different from the Hexaprotodon, hence the current accepted name. Heropsis liberiensis. These changes are based on their skull. The left image is a skull of the common hippo, while the right one is the pygmy hippo. Just for the sake of it, here is a skull of a boar. What exactly is the difference and why is the name indicates a resemblance to pig? I'll talk about that later in the video. As its namesake, pygmy hippos can be found in Liberia and some areas nearby. A distinct subspecies could be found in Nigeria until the last century, but it went extinct. Oh, by the way, the common hippopotamus can be found throughout Middle to Southern Africa, so that's quite the disparity there. First, let's talk about what made them be classified as hexaprotodon in the past. So, hexaprotodon means six front teeth. That's because they have six upper incisors, three on each side. Same with Heropsis, which is the pygmy hippo. Meanwhile, the Hippopotamus genus have four. Now, what differentiates Heropsis with other genera of hippos? There are several traits. The most obvious one from this image is the downwardly bent nasal anterior apex and the orbits or the eye sockets, which is significantly below the cranial roof. They also have weak flanges, so their skulls are smoother slightly convex and slopey, and significantly narrower. These traits are typical of basal hippos, which is why they are thought to be a basal group of hippos. Back then, scientists thought the closest relatives of hippos are pigs, which is why they are called heropsis, resembling pig. Not only that, compared to the common hippos, which have a relatively straight posture, pygmy hippos have downward slow posture, like a pig or catoblipus, if you know what that is. Anyway, their general forms are similar to the common hippo. They are chunky animals with brownish thick skin. They also secrete hipposudoric acid, just like the common hippo, which gives them the iconic pinkish hue to their skin. They are only half the size of the common hippos though, with length of up to 175cm and heights of 100cm. In comparison, the common hippos are usually at least 3 meters long and can even reach 5 meters. Pygmy hippos are also significantly lighter than the common hippos, with only around 200 kilograms compared to a ton or even two. These distinctions of traits are related to their behavior, of course, so let's talk about that. But before that... Pygmy hippos are more terrestrial than the common hippos, which is why their posture is sloped downwards toward the front, to make it easier to traverse the forest. Their small size also enables that. Their behavior somewhat resembles other tropical forest mammals, such as tapirs and wild boars. But they are still semi-aquatic mammals, of course. Common hippos' orbits are located toward the tip of their skull 
so they could peek from underwater. Meanwhile, pygmy hippos don't because they don't spend that much time underwater. They can stay submerged just like common hippos though, as they also have muscular flaps inside their ears and nostrils to prevent water from entering the holes. They are sometimes observed to hide underwater during the day. After dusk, they travel on land to feed. They could spend hours to feed on shrubs, herbs, and fruits. They will return toward the riverbank before dawn. They will then hide inside burrows or stay submerged. While the common hippos like to live in a herd of tens to hundred individuals, pygmy hippos are more solitary. Their herd is usually just a mated pair in their calf. Most just live alone. We actually don't know much about their life cycle in the wild. Everything we know is basically from captive individuals in zoos, which can be quite different from the natural population. In zoos, they form a monogamous pair. They can mate both on land and underwater. Meanwhile, the common hippos only mate underwater. They don't have breeding season in captivity, so they can breed throughout the year. Gestation period lasted for six to seven months. Usually, a single calf will be born, but twins can occur. Baby pygmy hippos are precocial. They can walk and even swim by themselves, but they still need to suckle on their mother. When the mother is gone to forage after dusk, babies don't follow their mother. They will hide in their burrow or underwater instead. This period lasts for six to eight months before they are finally fully weaned. They will reach sexual maturity after three to five years. Before talking about the discourse, let me briefly talk about their conservation status. They are considered endangered by the IUCN. They are hunted by locals as food source, but that's not the primary cause of the population decline. The primary cause is habitat loss as they are technically still forest animals. Deforestation causes their habitat to be fragmented. This leads to the decline of genetic diversity. Now, let's talk about the discourse which is what made me decided to make this video in the first place. I was scrolling Twitter on the weekend and I saw a short video. Basically, the person said pygmy hippo is endangered and money should be spent protecting their habitats, not breeding them in captivity to exploit them. I think the person said some more things to this own Zeus, but I might misremember since I can't find that video anymore. It's gone for my For You page. But I'm pretty sure I'm not hallucinating. Anyway, let me give you an insight as an actual zoologist. Their first point is valid. It would be nice if people could spend money protecting their habitats. But it's not that simple, you know. Even if you would spend money to do so, there need to be somewhere you could spend the money on. Like, some groups who will actually do the action with your money. After all, most of us are just some random person that live in our own place. Sure, some of you could afford to travel there and maybe do the actual work, but there are some legal stuff you gotta take care of, right? Good news is, there is or are some organizations, foundations, and stuff like that that focus on big hippo conservations. Still, you cannot just give them a bunch of money and expect them to grow forests and breed big hippos on said forests. That's not how it works. As I've said, there are legal issues administrations, and stuff like that. Their habitats exist within several countries. And of course, each country has citizens. Each have their own need. You cannot just drive them away to make room for hippos. Even if there are no people, you need to consider the ecosystem balance. You shouldn't just care for hippos while disregarding other animals. Also, you gotta think about their sustainability, you know. There are carrying capacity to consider and stuff like that. Now, let's talk about captive breeding discourse. Since decades ago, zoos have been one of the important aspects of conservation. Not only for education, zoos also serve as captive breeding center. Think of it like this. If we cannot save animals in their natural habitat for whatever reason, wouldn't it be nice if you have a spare population somewhere? That's the idea. And to be fair, not just an idea. Such case had happened several times, not necessarily strictly in zoos though. As I've stated, we basically don't know anything about their natural life cycle in the wild, but we know a lot from captive animals, which is zoo animals. 
You do need to pay extra attention to the population genetic though, since the genetic diversity of captive populations tend to plummet. That's the role of genetic conservation. I myself have done such research. Well, not for pygmy hippos, that is. It was on deer. But anyway, zoologists can learn a lot from captive specimens. If captive specimens exist, it's easier to sequence the DNA, it's easier to analyze morphology, and stuff like that. In IUCN, there are specific specialist groups. In many of those specialist groups, the leaders are not faculty members of academic university nor researcher at a research institute. Many of them work in a zoo. There are also several international organizations that serve as a network of zoos around the world to ensure the quality of zoos and aquariums. Some zoos even donate their profit for conservation efforts. My point is, zoos are not evil exploitative organizations. Zoos are actually beneficial for zoology and conservation. That being said, there are indeed bad zoos. Zoos that don't pay attention to their animal welfare and stuff like that. I don't exactly know the condition of Mudang and other animals in that zoo, since I've never been there, so I cannot say for sure that they are well cared. If they don't, then what you should do is protest against the specific conduct, not against zoo or captive breeding as a whole. Some people say animals don't belong in the zoo, they belong in the wild, and I personally agree. The problem is, the wild that you're talking about is declining. It's getting worse and worse. Many of such occasions are caused by humans. Releasing them to the wild would basically just letting them walk to their doom. If you say that's how it should be and let them perish naturally, then sure, you can stick to your worldview, but don't paint them as altruism or claiming that it's the correct way, because at the end of the day, it's just another subjective view. Same with those that think we should keep captive animals as a spare population. Lastly, about the animal popularity discourse. Is a wild animal being popular on social media good or bad? Well, I think the correct answer would be neither. But for me personally, like me as a person, it's good. My passion is education, which might be a weird thing to say. At times when an animal becomes viral, it creates a good timing to educate people about said animal. Just like what I did by making this video, basically. That being said, there can be a negative effect of this kind of occasion. Sometimes people deliberately harass said animals, maybe for content or whatever the reason is. Sometimes, what happened when animals became popular is more people want to keep them as pets. Some people might think it's outrageous to keep hippos as pets, but some people think otherwise. Just Google it you'll see some cases of people keeping hippos as pets. Some even lead to disaster. But when we're talking about animals in general, such occasion is more common than you might think. Some people even jump into the trend, they keep them as pets, then make contents on them for profit. Now that's literally animal exploitation. But still, in my opinion, you shouldn't gatekeep animal popularity. Instead, you should educate people to not condone bad behavior. At the very least, educate yourself so you are not part of the problem. If more person does that, maybe someday such behavior will be strongly discouraged. For now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, I'm kinda curious. Are there anyone that stumbled upon this video yet never seen Mudang on the internet before? If you are one of those people, let me know in the comment. Anyway, enjoy your day.